Welcome back to Echo Ridge and another episode here in our Ultimate Beginner's Guide. Today, we're going to be entering the mid-game. Now, I know some of you might be confused by that statement considering we're already up at cycle 151. But remember, the timing isn't really important. Some people tend to get wrapped up on am I playing fast enough or am I playing slow enough? But I implore you not to compare yourself to any sort of made-up standard that you may see or read about on the internet. The only thing you have to keep an eye on is all of your resources and your food. And if it takes you a thousand cycles to get to the same place that it takes somebody else 200 cycles, who cares? Just means that you enjoyed the game for a little bit longer. Now, with all that being said, typically I would be moving a little bit quicker just because it is my playstyle. But in this series, we've been learning a lot. We've been taking our time and we've been taking a look at everything in a sort of piecemeal fashion. And today we're going to do a little bit of the same. It's time for us to start exploring all the way out here, except a lot of these biomes are not friendly habitats. Yeah, we've already sort of figured out how to conquer a slime biome, being able to take care of the polluted oxygen, utilizing all of our deodorizers. But places like this caustic biome here with all the chlorine aren't so easily handled. Additionally, the further your dupes get away from the base, the less oxygen there is. And so if we were to just start digging all the way up, they'd have to come all the way back down every once in a while to take a deep breath. And then they would return back up here. Now you can combat this a little bit by stopping off in some of these places that have a little bit of oxygen, but because of all these nasty gases sitting everywhere, or the chill that is likely to give your dupes some hypothermia, it's probably time that we protect them by putting them in suits. The first suit I wanted to introduce you to you is not a real suit, and rather it's just an oxygen mask. And just like the Atmo suits that we're going to take a look at, it has a checkpoint, an oxygen mask dock, and the little masks themselves. And they would help the dupes out by not having to return back to the auction area so often, but it wouldn't actually protect the dupes from all the hydrogen and the chlorine and getting that eye irritation. Because the auction mask is literally just a mask that they wear on their mouth. And it wouldn't actually stop the duplicate from interacting with the environment, whether it be the extreme cold or the nasty gases. Another reason we need to do some exploring is because we need to start soon concentrating on getting access to some of the vents and geysers located around the planetoid, starting with probably this cool sus geyser. It produces polluted water at minus 10 C, which is absolutely wonderful, and then we'll be able to take all that polluted water, and just like we're doing another bathroom system, using a water sieve, we'll be able to clean it, and then our colony can use it to provide oxygen or to feed crops. While we wait on the research for the regular Atmos suits, it's time to do a little bit of colony maintenance. As expected, this cool steam vent has heated this area up. And as you can see, we got a lot of reed fiber for our efforts, but now it's almost 40 degrees here, which means the thimble reeds can no longer grow. So we're going to start by digging all these up. We'll clean all this up and we're going to replant these thimble reeds probably up here. And then we'll just take the polluted water line that we had before and extend it all the way up. This way, we're going to have plenty of reed fiber for the future and getting rid of all the polluted water in here, which has caused quite a bit of a mess. And while it hasn't broken through our giant deodorizer wall, it's taking our carbon dioxide a little bit longer to sink to the bottom, which means it's starting to stack up here again. This is not going to be a long-term problem because as soon as we get rid of all the polluted water, we can get rid of all the polluted oxygen. Another thing to keep in mind when you start exploring further and further out is the amount of time that duplicates are going to spend transporting themselves from point A to point B. And there's a couple things we can do to mitigate that. First, by using the fire pole. The fire pole does exactly what you think it does. And we're going to start it at sort of the top of where our base is and just bring it all the way down. And what this is going to do for us is anytime a duplicate needs to go from, say, up here to down here, they can take the fire pole instead of the ladder, which is going to give them a 75% boost to their run speed. The other thing we can do is keep an eye out for more duplicants. Because all those duplicants are traveling so much, we'll need more duplicants to make up for that lost labor time. Looking through this set of duplicants, though, no one is knocking my socks off, so we're going to take the copper and wait another three cycles and see what the pods give us. And now with the fire pole complete, we can see the duplicants using it and they move quite a bit faster on the fire pole than they do the ladders themselves. So this will definitely help with our transport time, 
around the colony. Now to the subject of building the suits. The first thing you'll notice when you click on the Atmos suit checkpoint is they require refined metal. Additionally, when we click on the suits themselves, you can see they also require refined metal. And up until this point, we've been using the Rock Crusher to take all of our copper ore and turn it into copper. Well, every time we do that, we're losing 50% of that copper. Yeah, it's giving us sand on the other side, but that copper is a lot more rare than the sand. So there's a couple of other methods we can do to get a much better efficiency when we're turning copper ore into copper. One of them is we could start ranching smooth hatches. And smooth hatches are unique in the fact that they don't produce coal. Rather, when they eat an ore, they produce refined metal, and they do it at a 75% efficiency, which isn't too bad. And by clicking on a stone hatch here, we can see in order to increase the chances for our stone hatch to lay smooth hatchling eggs, we would just need to start feeding them ore. But that's an expensive proposition, right? Because when we're feeding them that ore, we're still only going to be getting coal back. So I really don't recommend using smooth hatches unless you absolutely have to. And the next option isn't available to you. And that is by using the metal refinery. The metal refinery produces refined metals from raw metal ore, except it does it at a one to one ratio. Now there's going to be a few contingencies that we're going to have to deal with, but we'll talk through those when we get there. The first thing you need to know about the metal refinery is it gets very, very hot. It also requires 1200 watts worth of power. It also requires a liquid to be used as a coolant to go through it. The long and short of it is if you have a cold biome with a bunch of water sitting in it, that's where you want to put this first metal refinery of yours. And it just so happens that we do right over here. Now it's going to be a little hairy when we get in there for the first time because there's a lot of polluted oxygen and it's pretty cold. But by doing it this way, we're going to be able to save ourselves a lot on the other side. Now, because this whole other biome is in the way before we can even get to this biome, I'm going to start by coring through here. And just like we did here, I'm going to try to keep dropping the water to the bottom so that it's more easily gathered. It's always good to take a quick look at the temperature overlay to make sure the duplicates aren't about to dig themselves into some very hot scalding temperatures. So I think in this case, this is going to be the path of least resistance. There's going to be a little bit of oxygen here. We'll be able to bounce up here and start digging down from there. Now, we don't want all of this water to necessarily end up on top of this cool slush geyser because this cool slush geyser with all the water sitting up top is not going to be able to emit more polluted water. It's basically stifled itself because it's overpressured. We also need to go to our skills pane and do a quick skills check just to make sure that we had the super hard digging to be able to get through the abyssalite. And we do, thanks to Catalina. I think it's about time, considering we're sitting at around 20 morale for all the duplicates, to throw in a couple of extra skills. In this case, we're going to give Catalina some improved construction, and that way they can build those ladders a lot quicker. We also put the Stinky into Critter Ranching. It had been a minute since we had looked at them, so now our colony is going to have two ranchers, Bubbles and Stinky. And then finally, I think I'm going to round it out by giving all the duplicates up to improved carry too. So when they are moving materials in and around the colony, they'll be able to do it a lot more efficiently. Now of note, most people don't have the interest in improved carry, so this will just raise your morale requirement. But when you're sitting in the 20s, there's nothing wrong with having your duplicates sitting at 10 or even 15 morale requirement. As long as your infrastructure is stable and you know the duplicates are going to be able to get those morale buffs that they've been getting every single cycle. And since we're over here, I'm also going to end up dropping this water and bringing it all the way down here. Now, at first you may think, wouldn't it be easier just to take a liquid pump and draw it out? Well, maybe, but remember, there's more than one way to do a lot of things in auction not included. What I mean by that is we can just dig this out and let gravity take its course. We're gonna block up this part right here and just let it fall all the way down here, where it'll go down here, past these points, and then finally end up into our wonderful water tank, where I am pretty sure we have enough room. But the other good reason why I wanna add more water in this is because it'll give us more thermal mass. Remember, we have all of our oxygen going through these pipes and the water is responsible for keeping it cool. 
And so far, it's doing a great job. You'll notice the water tank is still only sitting at 24.6 degrees. Now, in doing this, I need to make sure the duplicates can get down another way since we're about to block their entrance. And if they can, they can run down here, take this ladder, and then hop over these tiles. So all we need to do is plug up this hole right here. And with the hole plug, we'll just take down the wall and all this water will slowly start draining that way. And then we get to watch the excitement of the water moving all the way down towards the bottom of our base. You'll note that I have a bunch of two tile high blocks here and that way when the water hits, it can't go in another direction. We're sort of forcing it to go where we want it to. You have to make sure that you get rid of the bottom most tile and that way all the water drains and here it goes. Now there is some disadvantage of doing this method in the fact that the duplicants are going to keep getting the soggy feet, which could give them that plus 10% stress per cycle. Just another reason why I absolutely love the shower, because it gets rid of the soggy feet, sopping wet, all the eye irritations, and gives them a plus 3 to morale. And here we have our wonderful waterfall in action. And it won't take too long for all the water that was up here to end up all down here. Now we'll have to do a little bit of mopping, but for the most part, this will take a fraction of the time and we didn't have to build anything to do it other than a couple nicely placed tiles. While we're waiting for the waterfall to finish up, the next pod popped. And while I really do love grabbing some more Paku because the more wild Paku you can get, the more free Paku fillets you'll be able to get, which we then turn into cooked seafood. But instead, there's a couple of duplicates in here that I'm considering. The first one is this Joshua because they have tidying and digging, which would make them a great duplicate to help out with our expansion efforts. And their only negative is they use the bathroom for a little bit longer. And then there's a Camille who has plus nine to machinery. And that interest in operating could really help when we start using the metal refinery because it is an operating task. And their only negative is they're an unpracticed artist, which for some you can consider it a positive because while yeah, they can't really do artwork very well, because they don't know good art from bad art, they get a better decor morale bonus. In this case, because of the theme of the episode is the machinery, and plus nine is nothing to shake a stick at, I think we're going to take this Camille. Before we did that, I made sure that we had plenty of food on hand, and that we're producing enough food, which we are. As a quick reminder from our omelette map, we're able to support about nine duplicates on omelettes once these ranches were full. So in that aim, I think we can finally get rid of all of our mealwood. We also know that we're producing enough oxygen for 15 duplicates, so we're doing okay on the oxygen front. We made sure that they have a cot and an available mess table, and then all we have to do once again is make sure the schedules are good, their priorities are set, and we're good to go. At about this time, you can see that the water transfer is really slowing, so what you might want to do is just do a quick mop. All of this water will be mopped up by the duplicates and then dropped off into the bottle emptiers. Now it's time to break into this biome and start setting up our metal refinery. But before we dig in here, remember this has a bunch of polluted oxygen. So to make sure our base doesn't get any dirtier, we're going to throw a couple of deodorizers in here and extend our power spine just a little bit more. And I think the way we're going to work ourselves in here is going to be up through the top here and we're just going to dig all the way over. We'll also take the opportunity to drain all this water as we go down. And then we're also going to dig lower into this biome as well. So all this water and all of this water all drains into the bottom of this biome. And considering there's a lot of ice here, it's going to chill it down very nicely, which is going to be important when we start using that metal refinery. Now, as a reminder, because we're not in Atmos suits yet, there's going to be a good chance that our duplicates are going to catch a case of the slime lung, especially for duplicates like our digger, who's going to spend more time down here than the others. The good thing is once all that polluted water drops into the cold, the cold will end up killing off those germs. So it'll be a problem, but just temporarily, and it's not going to be too big of a deal. We're also going to drop this water tank right here. And after a couple cycles of digging, we now have a beautiful pool of all sorts of nasty water. And even better, it's sitting in a very cold biome, which is going to keep chilling this water down for quite some time. Now, I don't want the duplicates to get sopping wet every time they walk down here, so we're actually going to mop the rest of this up. And then we're going to put some mesh tiles here so we can actually work on them. I'm going to start off with a bottle emptier. That way we can drop any polluted water that we find right back down into this tank. 
Remember previously we were injecting it into the bathroom system? Well, we don't have to do that anymore. And then I'm gonna go one further and produce a tile right above this cool sauce geyser. So all the water that it ends up producing is gonna be forced into this tank. Now to be clear, I don't love the fact that there's a bunch of other type of water in here, such as brine and regular water. It just means that we're gonna have to be a little bit careful before we just send it off all over the colony. Because remember, this cool celeste geyser is never going to stop producing water, other than in its dormancy period, which we can learn more about by clicking Analyze on the geyser. Our pay has the field research skill, which means they're able to do geographical analysis on vents and geysers. And now we're finally ready to put down our wonderful metal refinery. The first thing we have to take a look at is what are we going to build it out of? Well, I already told you that the metal refinery is likely to get very hot, it's producing 16,000 DTUs per second when it's being ran. The igneous rock might be our best case for what we have right now, considering buildings built out of igneous rock have a plus 15 degree overheat temperature, as does buildings built by granite. And because we're building this in the middle of a cold biome, I'm not too worried about the heat that this is producing. Now that we have access to this wonderful cold biome and we don't have to worry about the heat we produce too much, we can also put down a kiln and I'll throw it, say, over here. Now the kiln can be built out of just about any metal ore, and it is unique in the fact that it produces a lot of heat, but it itself does not have an overheat temperature. And once we finish the kiln, we're given access to two more materials, one being refined carbon, which will be used in the production of steel, and the other being ceramic. Buildings built out of ceramic have an overheat temperature of plus 200 C. So if you were up against the wall and had to build this metal refinery in a biome that was not cold, you can put down your kiln, make enough ceramic, and then build the metal refinery out of it. And it would have a much higher overheat temperature than 90 degrees because ceramic metal refineries can go all the way up to 275. But we're not gonna have to worry about that for a very long time considering A, this cool slush geyser is constantly producing polluted water at minus 10. And B, there's also a bunch of ice here that's just going to continue to melt over a very long time. These cold biomes, if used in the right hands, are very, very valuable. Because as I'm sure you are aware, a lot of people's colonies, when they start off as a beginner, end up dying to heat death. Well, that's not going to happen when you're doing everything inside of a very cold biome. The next problem we have to account for is the power. Remember, the metal refinery takes 1200 watts. And up until this point, We've been using this two-strand standard wire that has a maximum power usage of 1,000 watts. That's where the conductive wire that we use inside of our oxygen machine will come in handy. So at this point, there's sort of two methods that we could use using that conductive wire to get power up to that metal refinery. One, we could put in a large power transformer and start building out a very sophisticated power network and spreading power all throughout our colony. The quick 30 second explanation on how you use these is you have a main power spine that is disconnected from all your consumers. And then your distribution network comes off the bottom of the transformer and it's those lines that are sent wherever you need them. And as you can see, they're physically disconnected. This is the main power spine and then this is the start of a distribution network. Where this becomes powerful is you can add another transformer and keep extending your main power spine. And now, for instance, in this example, I could run 1000 watts off of this transformer and then run another 1000 watt line off of this transformer. For clarity, these are large power transformers and they can actually handle power flow up to four kilowatts. And when they start drawing enough, it might be too much for your standard power spine, which is why you normally start your main power spines using heavy watt wire and it would look something like this. So now whenever I need to send power anywhere I want, I can just come right off of this large power transformer. Now that is a very down and dirty explanation, but as I've said before, I've done a full episode on just power if you want to get more into the weeds with it. In this case though, this would still be a very long run, and this isn't going to be a permanent facet of our colony. So in this case, it's going to be easier just to put in an entire new power grid just for this area. And while this grid's gonna be similar to the one in our colony, note that this one has three coal generators and we're just gonna hook it all together using conductive wire to include the metal refinery and the smart battery. And then we gotta make sure that we don't forget our automation wire 
being careful not to have the power network automate the metal refinery as well. And then we'll make sure that we give the battery a good high threshold and low threshold so it knows when to activate the coal generators. In this case, we'll do something like 9060. We're also gonna put a storage bin here. And this storage bin is gonna hold coal. And that way, whenever the coal generator needs more coal, the duplicants will have an easy access, just like they did down here. Except we're gonna improve upon that system a little bit using our newfound knowledge of the auto sweeper. It just so happens that an auto sweeper placed in this position right here will have access to both the storage bin and each coal generator's tile of interest, which means the auto sweeper can pick up the coal and deliver it to the coal generator. Now, what do I mean by tile of interest? Well, when a duplicate comes and drops off coal to this coal generator, it actually points it to a specific tile. And in most cases in oxygen not included, that tile is called the tile of interest. And you can see what tile that is by pretending to build one. In this case, we'll grab a coal generator from the build menu. And the tile that your mouse is stuck on when you're moving the building around is the tile of interest. And it just so happens to be the same tile that the power port is on. But notice when I move the mouse around, my mouse stays on this tile right here. So that's the tile that this auto sweeper needs to have access to. And as you can see, it does. We'll make sure the storage bin has coal selected and we'll put it on a priority of four because we don't need duplicates to fill this thing up every time the auto super grabs 50 kilos. We also need to make sure that we plug in the auto super to some power. And since our conductive wire can handle up to 2000 watts, once again, there is no problem with putting all of this on the same network. The last thing we have to do, which is a requirement for the metal refinery, is connect it with a liquid input and an output. By clicking on the metal refinery, you can see that it significantly heats and outputs the liquid pipe into it. And now you may start seeing why putting the metal refinery in this nice and cold biome was such a good idea. Because we're going to be able to absorb a lot of the heat being generated by the metal refinery and its liquid coolant. We put a liquid pump at the very bottom of this entire pool. And now we'll just extend our conductive wire network to make sure this pump gets power. And once it does, it's going to start pumping all of this liquid here, filling the metal refinery up with coolant. You may have noticed that when we dropped the water initially, it was sitting around seven to nine degrees. Well, already this water is going all the way down to about zero and looks like the high point is eight degrees. This is going to be something that you're going to want to keep an eye for just to make sure that you're not using the metal refinery too much until the cool slush guys are going to cool the pool down again. And note that it doesn't matter that this liquid is a bunch of hodgepodge liquids going into the metal refinery. It just needs coolant. It doesn't care what type of coolant it gets as long as it's a liquid. But here's what you need to keep an eye for. Remember, we're gonna be wanting to take copper ore and turning it into copper. Well, in the recipe, you can see that it's gonna generate 40.2 kilojoules worth of heat. But if you highlight over that little point, you'll get a message. And apparently right now, this metal refinery has the majority of coolant as brine. So it says it's going to raise the temperature of the contained brine by 23.6 degrees. So the brine coming in is sitting at one degree. So we know it's going to come out at around 26, 27 degree and be dropped off all the way over here. Now, this was a strategic decision as well. I'm taking all the hot liquids and dropping them over on this side of the pool. And that way they are as far away from the liquid pump as possible. Because eventually, that brine could get up to 50, 60, 70, 80 degrees. And then when we try to use it as coolant, we could then potentially be raising its temperature beyond its flash point. And a quick trip to the database shows us that if the brine gets all the way up to 102.8, it'll turn into steam. Well, if it does that in the course of being coolant, it'll break some pipes and just make a whole mess. So once again, just keep an eye on the liquids. But now we're ready to queue up our first few commands. We have about 140 tons worth of copper ore available, so I don't see anything wrong with queuing up a quick 99 production orders. And now the duplicates will come by and start that production. And there it is, our first batch of beautiful copper. Note that brine's coming out at 24 degrees and already cooling down because it's so cold in here. And it drops right over here. But because it's mixing with so many other types of water, and those waters are very, very cool, 
the temperature increase isn't going to be too bad at all. After a very short time, we already have one ton of refined copper and our output coolant is already down to 10 degrees. Now this system could last you a very, very long time. There's nothing to say that this can't be your permanent setup. Eventually you may want to get all whiz bang and fancy and build an industrial sauna and do all those sorts of things, but there's nothing wrong with using a system just like this. But now that we have all that copper being produced, we have everything we need to start making these Atmo suits. Doing that will cost us 100 kilos worth of refined copper. So we're going to put down, I guess, five suits for now. They do have to be built on tiles, so we'll make sure we put a nice solid floor in here. And then we'll queue up some Atmo suits themselves. Once again, we're going to be using copper because that's where our primary refined metal supply is. Note. All that reed fiber has come in handy. We're up to 178 units and every suit is going to require two. And I know I only built five suit docks, but I'm going to queue up six and I'll explain why in a little bit. And while those are being built, I wanted to highlight a few points about the Atma suit. First, as we discussed before, they will be able to insulate the duplicates from the cold or the heat. They're also going to make them much better at digging. You can see that while they're in their suit, they're going to be given a plus 10 to excavation, but notice they're also going to be given minus 6 to athletics, which means duplicates inside of suits move a lot slower. Now you can combat that penalty by increasing their athletic skill. For instance, this pay already has an athletics of 13, so when they put their suit on, they'll have an effective athletics of 7, which is not too bad, and they'll still move pretty quick. But if you wanted to, you could also put your duplicates into suit sustainability training, which will give them plus two to athletics and slows the exosuit durability damage. More on that in a minute. But once they get all the way over to exosuit training, notice that they get an exosuit penalty reduction and another plus two to athletics. The penalty reduction they're talking about is this athletics penalty. Now the suits do require 120 watts, but it's not a constant 120 watts. That power is only going to be used when that suit initially needs to be recharged. And that's why it's okay the fact that, yeah, we have a potential load of 2700 watts, but I have no problem adding all these suits to it because of how briefly they will actually increase the current load on the line. Not to mention the fact that as soon as we get enough copper, we're going to be upgrading our entire distribution network to be using conductive wire too. That way we won't be limited by that 1000 watts once again. Looks like Pei is just about finished with the last suit. So we can go to each dock and click deliver the suit. Now, unfortunately you have to do this manually. You cannot copy and paste over. But once you do this, it tells the duplicates that yes, we want a suit in each of these docks. Vert's gonna drop it off. And notice right now it says it doesn't have any power. And there's a reason for that, too. Even though it is connected to power, it's waiting for one more thing. And that is oxygen. Now, depending on how long duplicates are going to spend inside these suits, is going to sort of direct where you're going to pull that oxygen line from. In this case, we have a pretty chocked full line right here. So we're just going to bring that over. But you'll notice that I'm going all the way to the very first suit and then going back. And there's a reason for that. When a duplicate crosses the point to put an Atmos suit on, they're always going to grab the first available suit, which means this suit dock will be prioritized. But notice as soon as this suit started getting some oxygen, it's starting to charge. This initial oxygen filling is going to take the most time because each suit has to be filled. So don't get all excited as soon as you plug those suits into oxygen thinking that, all right, they're ready to be used. It's going to take several cycles, but once they are filled, it'll be much easier and much quicker to top them off whenever a duplicate returns with their suit. In the meantime, I've also built a set of Atmo suits at the bottom of our base. And that brings up an important point. Remember, we're not going to be just exploring the top side of our planetoid, but rather the bottom and the sides as well. So it's for this reason, a lot of people tend to put their bases or their colonies into boxes with one or two exits. And then right by that exit point, they have their suits. Well, I've done sort of the same thing, but notice the walls of my base are just made out of abyssalite. But when you're using your suits, you have to funnel your duplicates in a certain direction. For instance, in this case, any time that they go north of the colony, the only way they're gonna be able to do it is by going up through here and then left past the Atmosuit docks. 
And it's from this point right here, anywhere else they go, they're going to be in a suit. You need to make sure though, that they can't return somewhere else. For instance, if I had done something like this, the duplicate could put a suit on, and then when they return, they could bypass the suit docks and get into your base somewhere else. We wouldn't want that, because then the suit would never be returned to the Atmos suit docks, which means it wouldn't be charging and it wouldn't be getting fresh oxygen. Same way down here. Anytime the duplicates go down this ladder rung, the only way they can get there is by passing these suits this way. And that's where the last building that we need to put into place comes in handy. And that is the Atmos suit checkpoint. Now, when you're placing the checkpoint, remember what I said and the direction you want the duplicates to be in the suits. I'm gonna move it off this level so you can see it a little easier, but notice with the arrow facing right where the duplicate is in a suit opposed to where they are not in a suit. So for this reason, we need to hit the O key to rotate this building. And now it's starting to make a little bit more sense. And you can see that the blueprint is sort of showing where the Atmos suit docks need to be. And as a matter of fact, your checkpoint has to be directly connected to them, just like this. With that in place, we have Camille getting ready to go past the checkpoint, but before they do, they put on their suit. Stinky is doing the same. And now, no matter where they go, they're gonna be inside this suit. And all the meanwhile, being protected from the environment and breathing clean oxygen. Notice that these docks are already completely full. And it's because that line was just being used less so the suits were able to get much more of the oxygen. It's for this reason that people will just take a single leg right off their oxygen machine and have it only producing oxygen for the docks. Just make sure you think about how much oxygen your duplicates need to breathe, whether they're in their suits or not, so you're supplying enough for your colony with or without the fact that you have docks in place. It looks like these top Atmos suit docks are just about ready, so we're gonna put their checkpoint into place. And now, whenever they are gonna do any metal refining, or any digging all the way up, or any digging into some less than hospitable environments, we don't have to worry about it, because they're gonna be in a suit the entire time. Now, you may not think this area is very bad for the duplicates, because it's just cold, and there is some oxygen there that they can breathe, but remember, when they breathe the polluted oxygen, they'd be getting the yucky lungs, causing them to breathe more. Additionally, when duplicates are in cold, cold biomes, there's a chance that they'll get hypothermia. But we're not going to have to worry about that anymore. Thanks to the wonderful addition of our Atmos suits. The last thing I needed to cover is concerning this one extra Atmos suit right here. If we highlight over the suit in the dock, we can see that this suit's durability is already down to 99%. Well, when it hits zero, it's going to have to be repaired. And we do that repairing at the Exosuit Forge, just like when we built them in the first place, except the production order required is Repair Atmos Suit. Now, you can manually do this, or you can just click Forever. And now, whenever there is a worn Atmos Suit, in other words, a suit that has zero durability remaining, it'll be brought directly to the Exosuit Forge and repaired. Keep in mind that it will take one reed fiber, so keep that reed fiber growing. But while that errand of it being repaired is ongoing, the duplicates will have a spare suit here. So whenever this specific suit fails, that fresh one will be brought up to its place, regardless if it takes them a couple of cycles to get around to repairing the old suits. So how does it feel being in the mid game? We have a nice suit network going. We have our quasi industrial complex up and going and we're ready to explore. In the next episode or two, we're going to start turning our attention to some later game techs and unveiling the space biome. As a reminder, this series is not going to last forever. It's not meant to be a full Let's Play. Its primary purpose was to give beginners a stepping off point so that they feel confident exploring the game themselves. And from that point, they'll be able to watch a standard Let's Play and get a lot more out of it as far as instructions is concerned. A quick channel update as well. I'm going to be out next week and while i'm going to try to have at least one episode ready for you i can't promise anything as a reminder if you're still enjoying this series hit the like button so other new ani players can be introduced to this series as well until next time much love happy gaming and i'll talk to you soon